Patricia Atkins, or Patty, was last seen leaving work at the Honda of America automotive plant in Marysville, Ohio, where she worked as a supervisor. She clocked out 19 seconds after midnight on June 29, 2001. The plant was set to close for a week because of the upcoming 4th of July holiday. After leaving work that night, she has never been heard from again. Patty was a 29-year-old divorced mother of a 7-year-old daughter, McKaylee, at the time of her disappearance. Patty had been having an affair with a married co-worker at the time she went missing. She told her family and friends about the relationship and said he planned to leave his wife to be with her. Despite concerns by her family, Patty reassured them that they had an incredible connection. However, to an outsider, the following details would make the relationship seem very fishy. She had given him approximately $90,000 over at least a one to two year period, depleting her savings accounts and borrowing against her 401k retirement fund, getting cash advances from her credit cards, and taking out a second mortgage. The money was supposed to be so that he could buy out his share of his and his wife's jointly owned side business when he divorced her to be with Patty. Patty had told her older sister, Marcia, that he promised to start repaying the money on July 1st, two days after she disappeared. Law enforcement was unable to link any money from Patty to him. It appears that Patty may have given him cash and he never deposited any of it. Just before her disappearance, Patty told her friends and family she was going on a vacation to Canada in a remote location with him. She put her cats in a kennel and asked her sister to look after her daughter while she was gone. She said he told her they were going to a cabin in a remote area without phones so she wouldn't be able to call her family. Strangely, he also told her not to pack anything because they would buy whatever she needed once they arrived. Despite his instructions not to take anything, Patty had packed a small, teal-colored duffel bag. She told her friend she had bought blue lingerie at Victoria's Secret. The bag and its contents have never been found. Patty asked a friend to drive her to work the night she disappeared so she could leave to start their vacation. She told her friend that he had to give a co-worker a ride home and had told her to hide in the bed of his pickup truck under a truck bed cover until he dropped the other man off. When over a week had gone by and Patty had not returned for her daughter, her sister began calling Patty's home repeatedly, desperate to get in touch with her, but continued to get no answer. She then called his home and his wife answered. She pretended to be a customer and was told that he was not there but was expected back later. A few hours later, Marcia called his home again and was able to then speak to him. Apparently, he got very quiet and acted strangely, stating he didn't know what she was talking about and acted as if he barely knew Patty as a co-worker. Her family then went to Patty's home and strangely found in her closet paper money bands but without any money in them. These money bands were most likely from the money she had been giving him. Marcia then called the boyfriend's wife and told her about the affair and money that Patty had been giving him. She talked to the boyfriend and his wife both for a total of 45 minutes. He would continue to deny his relationship with Patty. Marcia then reported Patty missing on July 8, 2001. Detectives searched the boyfriend's home and his business. His wife told detectives that she didn't believe it was possible for her husband to have been having an affair. While searching the home, detectives found a birthday card from Patty to the boyfriend and a Hard Rock Cafe shirt from Florida that Patty had given him. They also found a letter written from Patty to the boyfriend. When the boyfriend was questioned, he said he and Patty had no plans to go on vacation together, he had never had an affair with her, and he only knew her slightly. 
He and his co-workers said they left the plant together at midnight, drove 30 miles in the direction of their hometown of Canton, Ohio, stopped at a Burger King restaurant, waited 45 minutes in the drive through line, got their food, and got home at 2.30 a.m. The boyfriend's wife backed up their story, saying her husband had in fact arrived home at 2.30 a.m. the usual time and that she didn't know anything about an affair. The Burger King manager, however, said they were never busy in the early hours of the morning and no one would have had to wait more than 10 to 15 minutes in the drive-thru to get their food. The equipment for the bed cover used the night Patty went missing was found on the truck, but the actual cover was found in a storage loft on his property. Police took the truck cover for analysis and found cat hairs on it and a small spot of blood. Patty's veterinarian determined the hair came from her cats that she had brought to the kennel prior to her shift that day. Law enforcement decided at the time to wait on technological advancements to test the blood because it was such a small amount and may not get more than one chance to test it. As of today, law enforcement has not released any new information on if the blood has been tested. The police also searched a newly concreted area on his property that was alerted on by a cadaver dog, but found nothing. He had placed the order for the cover just a few days before Patty's disappearance and had picked it up the same day of her disappearance and a week later he took it off and put it in the storage. The truck is usually used as a work truck and a co-worker stated that it would not need a cover because the bed needs to be open to haul equipment. The boyfriend said he used it to cover some fishing gear in his truck bed. It is reported that he normally didn't drive the truck much, but he drove it to work the night Patty disappeared. The boyfriend took a polygraph test about the case and it showed deception. Shortly after Patty disappeared, he quit his job at the Honda plant and never returned to work there. He remains a person of interest, but is not officially named a suspect, therefore his name is not mentioned in this video. The case has been difficult to solve without a body and without a murder weapon. Patty was declared legally dead in 2006. Both authorities and her family believe she was the victim of homicide, and as of today, her case remains unsolved. Maybelle Dawson was 68 years old when she was last seen in Jefferson Township, Ohio on January 3, 1998. She was entering her one-bedroom apartment on the second floor of the Martin Luther Manor on Liscombe Drive at approximately 9.30 p.m. wearing a tan jogging suit. No one has seen or heard from Maybelle since. Maybelle's family and friends became concerned when they could not reach her by January 5th and went to her apartment to check on her. Nothing was out of place in her apartment and there were no signs of forced entry. One of her winter coats was found draped over a chair and her pocketbook was found on the table which contained her wallet, cash, credit cards, and a rent check dated January 8, 1998. Her daughter then reported her missing to police, stating that it had been two days since she last spoke to her. Her bank account was never accessed after her disappearance, and her family says it is uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning, and she had never left or wandered off. Her family said Maybelle did not have a car, but would often ride the bus. At first, family members thought Maybelle left on purpose because she was mad at her family for not letting her live with any of them. Her children declared her legally dead in June 2003. Foul play is suspected in her case because Maybelle appears to have left her apartment with the intention of coming back soon. Authorities do not believe she was attacked within her apartment or lured from the premises. Suicide has not been ruled out, but has been deemed unlikely. Maybell had recently retired in 1996 from her housekeeping job at Miami Valley Hospital at the time of her disappearance. She had also worked as a key punch operator, an elevator operator, a department store sales clerk, and in a factory, and she had done volunteer work as well. 
Maybell is described as a loving woman who was close to her family. She was divorced and left behind two adult daughters when she vanished. Her case is still being investigated by law enforcement, but as of today, it remains unsolved. Nine-year-old Erica Nicole Baker was last seen walking a dog near the Kettering Recreational Center on February 7, 1999. Erica's parents were divorced, and she spent most of that day with her father, Greg Baker, in their hometown of Kettering, Ohio. Greg dropped Erica off at the home she shared with her mother, Melissa Baker, around 3 p.m. Erica asked if she could walk her aunt's Shih Tzu dog in Indian Rifle Park, which was close to her home. Erica left the house sometime between 3.30 and 4 p.m. to walk the dog. Two witnesses saw her sitting on a bench with the dog near the park's pond shortly after 4 p.m. Witnesses later saw the dog dragging its blue leash alone sometime after Erica was last seen. They called animal control to pick up the dog, but didn't realize the girl they had seen earlier was Erica until news reports of her disappearance surfaced later that night. Erica's mother reported her missing when she failed to return home later in the evening. An extensive search of the area produced no clues as to her whereabouts. A pink Winnie the Pooh sweatshirt was discovered on a road in Germantown, Ohio several days after she disappeared. Bloodhounds reacted positively to her scent on the clothing, but her family said the shirt did not belong to her. The police received leads that Erica was the fatal victim of a hit and run. The occupants of the vehicle had panicked and disposed of her body. Authorities said that they identified four possible suspects in January 2000, five months after she disappeared. The tips named Jan Franks, her boyfriend Christian Gabriel, Clifford Butts, and his girlfriend as the passengers. There are many conflicting accounts, but the story Christian gave the police is that the four occupants of the van were under the influence of drugs and alcohol and had recently went on a shoplifting spree and all had criminal records. They heard a thud and stopped the van to see the body of a girl lying in the middle of the road. They panicked and placed her body in the van. They then took the body to their apartment and proceeded to smoke crack cocaine. They partied for a while and then took her body somewhere else and buried it. There are conflicting stories on whether Jan Franks was the driver or if it was her boyfriend Christian Gabriel. Jan Franks died in 2001 of a drug overdose and the recollection of events that night came from Christian Gabriel in 2004. Frank's attorney, Beth Lewis, has refused to tell the police what Frank's told her about Erica's case prior to her death, citing attorney-client confidentiality. Ohio law states that a dead person's spouse can waive attorney-client confidentiality for them, and Frank's husband did just that. However, Frank's attorney has disputed Frank's husband's authority to waive confidentiality and continues to refuse to answer questions, despite being held in contempt of court and even being jailed. Many years later, she would finally break her silence and testify to a grand jury, but the testimony was kept secret. In February 2004, just three days before the statute of limitations on the offenses would have expired, Christian Gabriel was indicted for evidence tampering and gross abuse of a corpse. The grand jury had the option of indicting him for a range of offenses such as aggravated murder and vehicular homicide, but they declined to do so. They also refused to indict Clifford Butts, one of the passengers of the van. There is little information available on Clifford Butts and his girlfriend and the amount of participation, if any, in Erica's death. Prosecutors stated they believed Christian was driving the van which struck and killed Erica on Glengarry Drive near the Kettering Recreation Center, and he buried her body in Caesar Creek State Park to cover up the crime, which is a very large area of land. 
Many people believe that he said that Jan was the driver because she is no longer alive to defend herself and he wants to use her as a way to stay out of trouble. Christian led authorities to various places where he said he had buried Erica's body, but nothing was ever discovered in any of the locations and investigators stated they were not going to search again for her remains unless they found more evidence indicating where she was. Christian pleaded not guilty to the charges and maintains his innocence in Erica's disappearance and has stated his confession was false and he felt pressured by the police to confess and was fed the information. Nevertheless, he was convicted for evidence tampering and gross abuse of a corpse in connection with Erica's case in October 2005 and sentenced to the maximum term of six years in prison. He was released from custody in June 2011. Does Christian not remember exactly where they buried her body because they were all so wasted? Or has he been purposely deceptive so that her body will not be found and he will not be charged with murder? None of the suspects have ever been charged with murder due to a lack of evidence. Erica's body has never been located and her family still seeks justice and as of today, her case remains unsolved. On April 24, 1981, a female body was discovered alongside Green Lee Road in Troy, Ohio. The female was found wearing blue jeans and a fringe buckskin jacket with a Native American design. The coroner at the time concluded she died from strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. Investigators determined she had only been dead a few hours when the body was found. However, they were not able to identify the body and due to the fringe buckskin jacket she was wearing, they labeled her the buckskin girl. In 2001, the Miami Valley Regional Crime Lab in Ohio was able to generate a DNA profile using the unidentified victim's blood from a sample that had been in storage since 1981. They would then upload the DNA into a public genealogy database. The company they used worked similar to the way consumer companies such as Ancestry.com work to track a person's lineage. Big companies like Ancestry.com won't allow nonprofits the use of their massive database, which can hold millions of DNA samples. The company they chose would have a fraction of the DNA samples, however, a match was found. They were amazed a match was found considering the size of the database was so small. Now that they had a sample of DNA from the unidentified female, they were able to generate a sketch of her face, hoping to finally identify the buckskin girl. When they released the sketch, they would receive 2,000 plus tips, but all of them led to a dead end. Speculation started swarming around the possibility of a serial killer, but no proof of this was ever found. It would be 17 years since the sketch was first released, but on April 11, 2018, she was finally identified as Marsha King, a 21-year-old girl from Little Rock, Arkansas. The reason they had so much trouble identifying her is she was never reported missing by her mother. Her mother thought her daughter was alive and would return home one day, and therefore she kept the same phone number and lived at the same address all these years. To this day, investigators continue to look for King's killer and the reason King was in Miami County in the first place, which continues to remain a mystery.